Okay, I think it's time. Um, hi guys, my name is Luca, and um, this is my talk, Advanced Tag was Final, and has the extremely clickbaity subtitle saying farewell to free. Uh, we'll see about more about that later. Uh, I'd really like to thank all of you for coming here and um, the Flatmap Oslo team for having me. I've never been to Norway, it's always uh, a cool experience, and um, yeah, thank you guys. Okay, so uh, a little bit about me. Um, as I said, my name is Luka Jakobowicz. Um, I'm a software developer at Codecentric, just like the last guy you heard here. <laughs> And um, I also co-organize the Scala Dusseldorf and Idris Dusseldorf meetups. So if you're ever in Dusseldorf um, and we're having an event, please come by. Uh, we always like to see new faces. And um, I'm also a maintainer of various CATS libraries, CATS Effect, CATS, um, MTL, CATS. And I also maintain the Outwatch library, which is uh, a small thing I created a time, some time ago. And of course, I'm very enthusiastic about functional programming, which is also the reason I'm here right now. So um, yeah, let's begin. Uh, a little overview before. So first, I want to go into the motivation. And of course, uh, I had this very clickbaity uh, subtitle. So I'm also going to include the whole free versus tagless final thing um, in the motivation. And then I want to talk to you about program optimization interpreter transformation, and also uh, stack safety. Those are the three key issues I'm going to talk about. And um, of course, at the end, we'll try to come up with some conclusions. And yeah, so let's start with the motivation for this talk. Uh, I think tagless final is a really, really cool way to structure your programs, because it basically allows you to separate um, the program description or the description of a problem with its implementation or with its uh, details, right? So uh, Tagless Final is super cool. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into a lot of detail on how it really works. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you kind of know how it works. If not, then um, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so there are a few certain problems that are still hard to solve while staying within uh, the constraints of this interpreter pattern, pattern right? So Tagless Final uses this what I call interpreter pattern, it's, uh, which basically means that we build up this program or we describe a program and then we interpret it later, similar to what we just saw with uh, FreeMonad and what Marcus showed us. So um, there are problems that are hard to solve, and this is because uh, we, when we work in these abstract ways, um, we, we always lose the ability to um, make use of special functions for uh, special uh, functions that our instances have. So for example, if you abstract over a bunch of databases, then you won't be able to use specific features of one such database. And this is, of course, a problem whenever you abstract anything. So um, this is a general problem, but it's also a, a thing in Tagless Final. And we're going to see if we can kind of manage that in some way. And of course, I want to show off some new libraries in the uh, type level cats ecosystem that are that spawn basically directly to address some of these problems and of course I want you all to have fun along the way this is a fun talk um, even if you don't use tagless final this might be cool so I hope you all have fun so free versus tagless oh, this is gonna get me like a million views <laughs> so but actually I want to preface this uh, free and tagless are two kind of different beasts but they're sometimes used for this same um, for the same purpose, which is this interpreter pattern, where we uh, describe a problem and then uh, provide a solution uh, in a separate step. Right. So this is only about free versus tagless in that particular context. You could also you can also use free monads, for example, to implement an I/O or something like FS2 stream, which is basically like a specialization of free or somewhat. Okay. So. First up, we have the things that are advantages for the free monad, or free monad and free applicative. So free applicatives allow us to inspect the inner structure of uh, these applicative programs, and that allows us to optimize uh, certain things. And 
That is a really powerful thing to have, and it works because free applicative is a data structure, and we can then look inside it, and it doesn't have any functions uh, where we can't look inside, like the free monad. And yeah, that's one advantage of free, and then also you have uh, stack safety by default, right? So if you were to use a, a tagless final um, uh, program, and then you were int to interpret it into a non-stack safe monad, then you could get uh, stack safety issues. Like most monads you interpret into, like state or IO uh, task, are stack safe, but there are some that are not stack safe, and then you have these problems that you don't have with the free monad. So, uh, on the other hand, advantages for the tagless final is we have almost no boilerplate. Like setting up a free monad uh, program uh, means you have to do a lot of ceremony, a lot of steps. You have to define your DSL in terms, your algebra in terms of um, in terms of data structures, and then you also have to provide uh, smart constructors. And if you want to use multiple algebras, you have to set up this whole. Um, uh, co-product thing where you basically have to switch between the uh, algebras. And it's a lot of boilerplate. And it also, because we're creating all these data structures, it's um, not really performant. And if you compare it with Tagless Final, it's a lot more performant because we don't have these intermediate data structures that are only there to be torn down and interpreted into something else. So Tagless Final has less boilerplate. It's simpler. And it's also more performant. And it's also, what I think is actually the coolest thing is that it's not married, it's not bound to this monad applicative constraint. We can use it with any um, type class or any constraint we want to give it. And that basically allows us to use the principle of least power. That, that means that we can constrain our programs to exactly the power we need and not a single bit more. And that actually um, gives us more uh, ability to reason about our programs. Because if we only give uh, our program the ability to have this amount of power, and we can't make use of all of these other extra features, we have less ways uh, that we don't think about. And that means, in essence, that um, we can create simpler program pro bleh, programs. Right. So these are the advantages. Now, of course, I want to look at those two uh, advantages for free and basically mitigate them uh, so that there are no more advantages for free. <laughs> so the first thing is program optimization. And um, uh, someone once told me, and this is paraphrased, that optimization in general requires peak ahead, which requires data structures. And that seems pretty logical, right? So if we don't have a data structure, how could, we, uh, how could it possibly work for tagless final? Well. One solution is to interpret things twice, right? So we have this program, and before we interpret it into something like I.O., where we actually want to run it, we get to interpret it into something where we can extract the useful information that we need from our program in order to uh, create a more, more sophisticated, a more knowledgeable interpreter, right? And we'll see that. So um, I actually created this little library called Sphinx, um, it's Sphinx with a Y, which is a cat breed, so it fits into the whole cat's uh, naming scheme thing. <laughs> but yeah, we'll see about that later. Um, for now, let's look at a simple example, right? We have this key, 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 key value store algebra, which defines only two operations. One of it is a get, which um, when given a key, which is a string, it will return an option of string inside of this F context, which can be whatever we want to interpret into later. And then we also have uh, a put operation that will take a key and a value, of also of type string, and um, it will then return unit, which basically means that it will have to store the key value pair inside this KV store. So then let's look at this uh, fairly simple program. We have a program that is uh, bound by applicative, and we have a list of get request, so we have a list of keys we want to get, signified by this gets parameter, and we have a list of things we want to put into this KV store. So we have a list of um, string string tuples. So these represents key values, key value pairs. This is the simplest uh, thing I got. And we also, of course, need our KV store interpreter right here. And then at the end, we want to return a list of all the um, 
all the values we got out of this KV store. So what we do for that is we use the traverse function to traverse all of the um, puts and then use the, uh, the put operation, right? So we uh, deconstruct this tuple and then use the put and then this whole thing will return an f of unit or f of list of unit actually, but it doesn't matter because we then say to ignore that value and use the traverse function to um, traverse all of our gets with this f.get operation, which will return, of course, a, a list of option of string, and then we use this map and flatten to basically get rid of all of the none cases um, in, in the result. So what we get in the end is a f of list of string. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, nodding, okay, cool, great. So what are some potential optimizations we could do for this program? So if we use the simple I.O., we wouldn't get, this thing would run uh, sequentially, right? The standard applicative for any, uh, for I.O., for any I.O. type in the ecosystem like Monix Task or Cat's Effect I.O., um, the standard applicatives doesn't run actions in parallel. So that is a simple optimization we could do immediately. Uh, and then we also maybe want to remove duplicates, right? So if we have a bunch of gets and maybe this list has the same key twice. So in a naive interpreter, we would have to uh, hit the network twice for the same key and it would return the same value. So ideally, we could just remove these duplicates and only uh, hit the network once for each key. And then, of course, um, if we put something and then get something with the same key, then that should actually not hit the network, right? Because we already have that value. We don't need to go to the network to retrieve the value because we've, already, we've just given it uh, to, to the network. So those are three optimizations, and we're going to look at how we're going to uh, optimize for these. So first up, let's extract some information from our program, right? So our program has a certain number of inputs, and we're going to see if we can extract them. And I created this small um, pre-interpreter, which basically, um, as I said, uh, pre-interprets pre and gets out the information uh, of our program. So to do so, of course, because we have a tagless final program that's uh, bounded by applicative, we need some applicative f that is able to extract information. Um, so who knows of such a data type? What could we use here? Yeah, okay. I think I hear const. Const is very good. You could also use writer, but I think const is the better choice because it doesn't actually store the uh, values. And yeah, that's exactly it. So a const is a data type that has two type parameters and only stores data of the first type parameter. So, and if the first type parameter is a monoid, that means we can applicatively combine uh, values of const. So basically, we can lift any monoid into an applicative using uh, the const data type. And that is exactly what we're going to do. So our pre-interpreter has to have this type of kv store of const of m, where m is some kind of monoid that will include our, um, our structure, our in information. So let's look at how we're going to do this. Um, first, we create this case class kv store info, which is the information we want to get out. And that is just going to be a set of all of the um, gets of all of the keys. And then we also want to get a key value pair of uh, operations that put something into the k value store. And then we can define this interpreter, this pre-interpreter called extractor here. And then we have to define our get and put operations on it. So the get operation has to return a const of kv store of option of string. And we can just ignore that second parameter, option of string, and uh, because it doesn't actually store them. And we'll just return a const of kv store info. And because we only have the get operation, we'll return um, a set of the single key. And if we now combine a lot of these um, const operations, because set of, uh, a set of string has a monoid, we can easily um, uh, monoidally uh, combine all of these values into the end value, which will have all of our values inside this kv store info uh, class. So this is get, and put actually looks super similar. We return a const kv store info of unit, 
and um, it's just going to have an empty set and a map of this key and value pair. So this is actually really simple, but we can use this already, right? For, so for our program, if we use uh, the extractor uh, interpreter, and then we, we get back a const of uh, kv store info and uh, list of string, and then, uh, but this list of string obviously is not stores because it's a const a phantom type. And if we say get const, we get back our kv store info. So if we call this, we can immediately get all of, our, all of the um, inputs for a program. So that's pretty cool already. So now, next step is uh, defining a new interpreter using this information that can optimize um, for these things. So now that we have this information, we have to actually put it to use, right? So we could pre-compute pre some values. So for example, um, if, we, if we want to have a lot of get requests and we want to get rid of duplicates, we, should, we could just run, um, run, run, run the, uh, the interpreter for all of our um, get requests, store them somewhere, and then whenever the, uh, the optimized interpreter tries to, to, to hit the network, it will first look at this sort of cache thing to uh, get out the values so it doesn't have to hit the network. And um, yeah, that way our interpreter only has to look up the values inside of this store, inside of this uh, interpreter. And um, since this will be effectful, since we'll actually be using the original interpreter, that means our um, type will be IO of key v store of IO. So that looks a bit like a handful, but it's actually kind of easy. So it's just an IO that will compute a new IO interpreter for our KV store algebra, right? That makes sense. Okay, cool. So let's look at some of the code. So first, the first thing we want to do for our uh, optimized interpreter is we want to filter out all of the, uh, the puts calls in, uh, in, our, in our gets calls. I should have chosen better names. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but we have a, we have a bunch of um, get operations, right, the keys, and we, um, we don't want to include any, uh, we don't want to include any of those where, we, where we've already put a value into because we can um, take it out of the put values themselves. So that works, and then we want to use this part traverse function, which uh, traverses a data structure in, and then uh, combines the items in parallel using the cats parallel type class, and that will just call our original interpreter and um, actually perform the get action. And then uh, there is a map and map, which means because we have an F and then we have an option. So that basically means we're just going to, the only thing this, is, this does is instead of getting a value of just the, just the value, we uh, also store the key inside there, right? So we have um, a key value pair in there. And we'll see that right now. So if we map over this generated value, we get a list of option of a string string tuple. And because we don't really want this option in there, we're going to have to uh, flatten this again or basically uh, filter out the none cases, which we do right here in this val table, right? So now we get uh, a map of string to string, a map of keys to values that we got in our original step. And now it's time to create a new interpreter for KV store. Right, and for that we need first need this uh, get operation, and because we're in I/O, we're going to return an I/O of option of string, and for that we we're going to look in our lookup table that we computed earlier, and see if the key is defined in there, and if it's not, we're going to also look in um, in the puts we got out of the extractor, which might um, which will work for all of the other keys that we filtered out at the above section, at the right. And then we match this whole thing, and if it's sum, we already have the value, and then we can just wrap it in an option, wrap it in I.O. Uh, this is a pure value, we can just return it right there. And if for some reason, this shouldn't really ever happen, but if for some reason there's a none in there, uh, we can just call our original naive interpreter to get that one. And for put, uh, it's super similar, we will just call our original interpreter because we can't actually perform any um, optimizations on put. So this is the 
optimizing interpreter that will, will that has the type IO of KV store of IO, right? So this is a new interpreter um, in IO. Okay, so let's put this all together. First, we have our original interpreter, which is a KV store of IO that I didn't define here. And um, then we have a list of gets. So we want to get uh, a dog, a bird, a mouse, and then we also get, we want to get another, we, uh, we want to get bird again, but um, this is a bit contrived, but this list could be created dynamically somewhere so we can't really account for uh, the fact that it doesn't have duplicates. And then we also want to put uh, something into the cat key, which is a cat and an exclamation point, and then the same for dog. So very simple. Um, and then to get our info out, we use the thing we uh, did earlier using the const and the extractor. And then we have these two results, right? So the first result is the naive result, which just use, uh, the first result is the optimized result, which uses this optimized interpreter. And the second result, which of course has the same type and should have the same values, it should just be optimized, um, which will use the original naive interpreter. And well, let's see how it works out. So this is the result for the initial naive interpreter. So if we unsafe run sync this I.O., we get two uh, network requests for put, which is good because we want to put these two values. And then we also get four requests for get, right? So we get the dog, even though we already know what the dog value will be. We get the bird, we get the mouse, and then we get the bird again. So these are two uh, redundant cases we should be able to have filtered out if everything works. And of course, everything works because this is a presentation and I planned ahead. <laughs> so yeah, what we get here is we get the bird, we hit the network once for the bird, once for the mouse, and then we also put the cat and the dog. And of course, because all of this is run in parallel, and if we have four CPU cores, then, um, and the server is sufficiently fast, this will actually uh, compute uh, six times as fast, give or take. So, we basically uh, refactored our program with this op optimization uh, and we got six times the performance, so that's pretty cool. Right, so, but can we do better? Or maybe not better, but can we generalize this whole thing? And yeah, I think we can. And that is exactly what this Sphinx library does. So this is a Sphinx, uh, this is the breed of cat. It's not the prettiest breed, but I'm not judging. <laughs> Okay, so the Sphinx optimizer does uh, generalize exactly what we did. So, and this is not real code, but it's there to basically show you. So we have uh, an optimizer that is always going to work for a specific algebra, which has this type, which takes a type constructor. So it's like a, it's a weird kind, but this is the kind that almost all um, tagless final algebras have. And then we also take uh, a type constructor F, which has to be a monad. And um, then we also need a type M, which has to be a monoid, which is, was our uh, KV store info, right? So the extraction pattern. And of course, we also need to define an extract method, with, which is exactly an interpreter to interpret into our const of our monoid, monoid type. Right, so this is what we did. And then, of course, we also want to rebuild an interpreter, which is going to be here, an F of all algebra of F, which is, again, just a, a new interpreter. Alt of F is, you could give it a type alias interpreter. Um, and it, it returns a new one in this F context. And for that, of course, we need an original interpreter, and uh, we also need a, um, a value of M, which is the information we extracted from our program. And then we can define this optimize function, which is derived. And this doesn't ex work, again, exactly this way because um, Scala doesn't have rank n types, so it can't be defined exactly like this. But similar to this, we need to actually wrap the original program. But yeah, so we take a program, which is of type interpreter to a value f of a, and then we return a new program that is optimized, right? So it then also takes an interpreter and returns an f of a. And um, for that, it's very simple. We just extract it, we get an M back, and then we can rebuild it using our rebuild function, and then we flat map it to, um, to actually call our program with this new uh, interpreter, right? So this rebuild step gives us a new interpreter, and then uh, because it's an F, we actually need to flat map it to apply it. 
yeah, and that gives us the value. And yeah, that is exactly the Sphinx optimizer. Um, yeah, so that was cool. Uh, we can actually use this to lift values in a larger context. So right now, we've only been using uh, the applicative program, but we can use this to embed it into uh, a monadic applicative context, right? So here we have a monadic program uh, that also has an implicit value of an optimizer, kv store and f. And then we can use this optimize function that we get from sphinx.syntax to basically optimize only one part of this monadic program, which is applicative by nature. Right, and that is how we can combine monadic and applicative values. And if you compare that to how you would comp uh, combine monadic and applicative values while also optimizing it with uh, free monad and free applicative, you'll see that this is actually a ton more simple than uh, what you'd have to do there. So what are other cool Sphinx features? Um, there's also a notion of static optimizer, which is basically the same thing but doesn't return a... Um, a, uh, a new interpreter in, in this context, but just like that. Uh, that's why it's static in, the, in essence. Um, it doesn't pre-compute values. And then we also have a semi groupal optimizer, which basically just means that we um, remove all the mono monoidal structure. So instead of a mono monad, we have a flat map. Instead of a monoid, we have a semi group. And it works for, yeah, basically all of these uh, semi groupals things. So that is Sphinx. Um, and that is optimizing programs. So now let's look at what I told you earlier about interpreter transformations. And we'll see in a minute why this is useful. So maybe think about um, if we have an algebra of this form with an uh, with algebra that takes a type constructor to, and then uh, we have an appropriate interpreter, which is of the type al alg of f, where f is the type we're interpreting into. Um, how could we turn an algebra, uh, an interpreter of f into an interpreter of g, right? So, of course, if we have a way to turn uh, an f, any value of f of a into any value of g of a, then this should be fairly simple, right? And um, this is really actually fairly simple with a thing called functor k. And functor k, the k uh, stands for higher kinded or kind, I guess. and it's uh, dependent to, uh, to a functor just with uh, a the higher kind of type. So we'll see about this right now. So this is part of the main Kuhn library, which my uh, co-maintainer of cats, uh, Kailua Wang, maintains. And it's a really cool, small, uh, small library. It has this cute little main Kuhn logo. And the functor k looks exactly like this. So if you've looked at the definition of functor, it should look super super similar, right? It just has more holes, I guess. So instead of mapping over a type constructor f, we map over an algebra, which takes a type constructor. And yeah, so now we have, instead of a function, we take this higher kind of function called natural transformation, or function k. And this is exactly how we can transform um, uh, interpreters for one type into interpreters for another type. So for example, if we have an interpreter of option for some type, and we have a natural transformation from option to something like list, then we could um, very easily define an interpreter for list if we have this interpreter for option. And this, in Maine Kuhn, it actually makes it super simple because we have this cute little auto functor k annotation, which basically uses shapeless to uh, generate um, functor k instances for almost any algebras. Of course, uh, I think any algebras that are, of course, covariant, right? So functor k is a covariant type. And um, because kv store is fully uh, covariant, uh, that means we can annotate it with other functor k. And that means we get this map k function for free for all of our uh, interpreters. So we could do something like this. If we have an interpreter for IO, and now we want an interpreter for uh, Monix task, we can simply define this uh, natural transformation from IO to task using this to task method, and that is can predictors syntax that's a bit ugly, but again, no rank n types mean we have to do this. And then to get an a interpreter for task, all we have to do is call this map k function on uh, the interpreter for IO. 
and then that's basically it. And because our main coon derives all of these uh, instances of functor k for us, there's uh, basically nothing we have to do. We only need to provide this a natural transformation. So let's talk about stack safety. Uh, tagless final programs, I already talked about this in the beginning, are only stack safe when their target monad is stack safe, right? So for example, the try, it's not really a monad, but we can call it a monad. The try monad is um, not stack safe because it has to catch exceptions. It uh, accumulates thunks that will eventually uh, stack overflow if, we don't, if we're not careful. And um, free monads, on the other hand, if you were to interpret a free, mo free monad program into the try kind of monad, then um, it, it will completely be stack safe because uh, that's because the free monad has this stack safe data structure built in, at least the free monads we use um, in, in CATS and Scholar Z. So what is the solution to this? Uh, why can't we just interpret our program into free and then interpret it into our target monad from there? And that's actually really, really easy with something like Mancoon because of what we saw just now. So we can define this natural transformation uh, from any type f into free of f, if it has um, a monad instance, we just with this very simple um, lift f function, which is the same as the inject function uh, Marcus just gave us. And then we can call any interpreter, map it to free, and then just run the program with inside this interpreter and then just fold map it um, to, with the identity uh, natural transformation to get back the real value, right? So this uh, expression will actually give us the result in the target monad. We won't actually have, we won't actually see the free anymore in there. And this is completely stack safe, and uh, it's basically two extra lines we have to give it, and stack safety is solved in tagless final. I think that's pretty cool. Right, so of course I have to talk about other cool main coon features. Um, we also have invariant k and contravariant k, which are exactly like functor k, um, in their kind, but are invariant and contravariant. So we have invariant and contravariant functors in cats, and these are just the higher kinded versions of those. And another really cool thing is something called Cartesian K, which is based off the old name of uh, semi -gruple. right? So Cartesian was renamed semi uh, like half a year ago in cats, and um, basically what it allows you to, this Cartesian K, uh, type class is to, if you have a program and you have several interpreters, you can basically combine them to run your program simultaneously with a bunch of interpreters and get all of the results in like a huge tuple. And that's a really cool thing you can do. So yeah, that's Mancoon. And that's basically it for my talk. Uh, to conclude, I think of course, I'm saying this again, that tagless final is really, really cool. It's great for a separating problem description from uh, its implementation from the solution. And of course, it has its problems. It has its drawbacks. It has limitations. But with some additional approaches, like the one I presented here, we can keep this really cool layer of extraction without uh, sacrificing performance or stack safety or safety in general. And Scala as a language is not quite there yet. We're missing rank n types. And of course, like shapeless is based on macros to derive all these things. Um, so we're not fully there yet in terms of Scala features. Uh, but we can find really cool workarounds that work um, performantly. And yeah, I think you should all use it. And if you run into performance problems with tagless final or stack safety problems, these things can really help you out. OK, and yeah. That's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Luca Jacobowitz or on GitHub, Luca JCB. But I'm also uh, around here until tomorrow. And you can find me on Gitter, I guess. I'm very active in the CATS channel. Uh, yeah, any questions? No questions? OK, then thank you very much.